That drives my cow. Brilliant. Um, and Nicholas showing us in attendance. Okay, so um, just to remind everybody that just in case I can't see or hear, if you could let even just raise your hand or shout out so could, if there's any questions about anything. Um, and have you any other notices, Emer, from anyone else? Yeah, I think you said to start your receipt. Apologies from Linda. Apologies from Linda and delegated a vote to yourself. That's all I have currently. Okay, well, sure. That's everybody in then, really, isn't it? So um, we'll be considering a paper on issues in relation to the exit, which includes legal advice. So uh, what I want to get from yourselves is agreement that we move into closed session at the end to receive that legal advice. Is that agreed? Okay, sound. Um, we've already covered the we've already covered the apologies. Um, item two is the draft minutes from the fifth of May, and they're page five. Are members content to agree the minutes of that meeting? Agreed. Okay. Thank you. So matters are rising. Um, at the last meeting, officials were asked to provide an update on the Wi-Fi connection in the chamber. I think Jerry raised that and certainly I commend to support him as did others. So it's at page 14 as an update from the Director of Parliamentary Services. So uh, it's just really to ask, have you had any other comments? Or are you happy to note? It's up to yourselves. Happy to note, Chair, from my end. Okay, is everybody else good to go then? Okay, thank you. So agenda item four um, is the LCM inquiry and it's a briefing by the Institute for Government. And you may remember that we agreed to schedule a briefing from the Institute on specific issues that we wanted to consider as part of our ongoing inquiry and the LCMs. So um, part of this briefing um, will form part of the evidence being heard for, the, for our inquiry. And if you're content uh, that it be included on the official record um, and that answered our report. And so I just want to seek your agreement for that. Okay. So um, at page 18 of our packs, there's a, a paper from Memer. Um, and at page 28, there's a paper from the Institute for Government on legislative consent, how to rev <clears throat> revive the Seoul Convention. So today we're joined by the joint authors of that paper, Akash and Kelly, um, and Emer, can we just check that we can get both Akash and Kelly onto the spot, please? Well done, night. Thank you. I can see Akash, but I can't see Kelly. I can see Kelly as well now. Oh, there you go. I can see Kelly now. So you are both very welcome um, to the procedures committee. Um, so without further ado, I just want to know if you want to just give us a briefing on your paper, please. Yes. OK, no, thank, thank you very much, um, Chair and, and the committee for the invitation. Um, we have a few slides uh, just to back up our, our talk. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, which I hope will work on Starleaf, but I believe it should. Um, so hopefully you can now see the first slide. Okay, great. Um, Yeah, so first of all, uh, just to reiterate, um, it's great pleasure to uh, have this opportunity to, to contribute to the inquiry. So, so thank you for um, giving us um, this, this opportunity. Um, so yeah, my name is Akash Pound. I'm a senior fellow of the Institute for Government in London, um, where I lead our research program on devolution. I'm delighted to be joined by my, my colleague from the devolution team, Kelly. Uh, we'll be delivering this presentation together based on the report um, that, as you mentioned, we published last September now uh, into the Sewell Convention. Um, and 
that is the title of it up on your screen. So um, I won't say a lot about the Institute for Government, but uh, just to be clear that we are a non-partisan uh, independent think tank and our mission is to try to improve the effectiveness of government um, across the UK. And as I say, um, the devolution program is, is just is one part of it. Um, that, uh, and, and that is where I and uh, Kelly work. Um, so as far as our report was concerned that we're here to, to, to talk about and, and the broader issues, um, we decided to look at this question of the status of the Sewell Convention in the context of um, strains that the convention and the legislative consent process had been put under primarily as a result of uh, Brexit. So we'd seen, of course, the passage in 2018 of the EU Withdrawal Act, and then the passage in early 2020 of the Withdrawal Agreement Act, both without the consent of at least one of the three devolved legislatures. Um, and despite the fact that in both those cases, the UK government itself recognised that uh, consent for those uh, for, for that those bills should be sought because of the effects um, of the legislation on the devolution settlements. Um, at the time that we were carrying out the research, there were also looming conflicts on various other um, bits of Brexit legislation, most notably the UK Internal Market Bill Now Act, which did ultimately proceed again without consent uh, from, from the devolved level. Um, more broadly, we were carrying out this research um, in a context where there was a, a growing sense that Brexit had exposed the vulnerability of devolution to unilateral decision making taken at, uh, at Westminster and Whitehall. And all this, we felt, had contributed to a deterioration of relations between UK and devolved institutions at a time, moreover, when cooperation um, was becoming more rather than less important as a direct result of Brexit, which raises questions about how to cooperate in areas formally governed by EU law. So that's really why we started the project. And I would argue that um, developments since we published that report last autumn have, have really reinforced the, the importance of these issues um, and the importance of, of trying to find ways to improve and, and repair relations between UK and devolved um, institutions. Um, and so based on our research, we developed, as, as you know, a set of specific recommendations for how the Sewell Convention and the, the legislative consent process could be strengthened. And I'm going to say a few uh, words in in um, a little bit about the detail of those recommendations. Before I do that, I'm going to hand over to Kelly to talk through um, some of the research findings on which our conclusions were based. So, Kelly. Great. Thank you, Akash. Uh, could you mind making these slides um, full screen, uh, if possible? Um, I might be the only one struggling with a with a small laptop screen, but I think if you get them into power, into kind of PowerPoint mode, it might help. If not, it's no problem. Okay, um, <laughs> great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm going to briefly outline what the Sewell Convention is, why it matters, how it functions and how it's used. I'm sure most of you will already know this, but I thought probably best just to recap. So to, to begin, Devolution to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland left the core principle of parliamentary sovereignty in the UK intact, meaning that the UK Parliament retains the power to legislate for all parts of the UK on all matters, whether devolved or not. However, from the outset, Westminster committed itself to a self-denying ordinance that it would not normally legislate... Sorry. <clears throat> that it would not normally legislate on devolved matters without the consent of the devolved legislature in question. This commitment is known as the Sewell Convention or the Legislative Consent Convention, named after Lord Sewell, who gave this definition of it in the House of Lords in 1998. As Lord Sewell noted, the principle of legislating only with consent draws upon the precedent of the first period of devolution to Northern Ireland from 1921 to 72 
During this period, there was an understanding that the UK Parliament would only legislate within the field of Northern Ireland's transferred powers by invitation. And this convention was only dispensed with in the early 1970s as, as the troubles erupted. In our paper, we do actually trace the underlying principle of Sewell back even further to the government of the, to the dominions under the British Empire and relations with the Irish Free State. So why does it matter? As mentioned, the Sewell Convention is so important because of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. Parliamentary sovereignty is acknowledged in the uh, Memorandum of Understanding between the UK and devolved governments, which sets out the principles and processes for managing intergovernmental relations. This document states that the UK Parliament retains authority to legislate on any issue, whether devolved or not. Parliamentary sovereignty is also explicitly acknowledged in each of the devolution acts. This can be contrasted to federal states such as Canada, where the constitutional spheres of authority of the provincial legislatures are protected by a codified constitution and courts can annul any federal laws that stray into these areas. The doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, as currently stood in the UK, prevents any federal arrangement. So what the Civil Convention does is protect the political autonomy of the devolved institutions as far as is constitutionally possible. On to how it works. Within the UK government, the rules for how government departments should proceed when planning to legislate in an area where consent may be required are set out in the devolution guidance notes published by the Cabinet Office. It includes that governments are, the departments are required to establish at an early stage where the legislation will invoke the Civil Convention, take legal advice on this and then consult. The steps for the devolved legislatures are set out within their own standing orders. Legislative consent votes are usually scheduled to take place before the final amending stage of the bill at Westminster in order that Parliament can change the legislation in light of consent decisions. But there's no formal recognition of the consent process within the procedures of the UK Parliament. There's no express requirement for either House to acknowledge the past passage of a consent motion or a decision by a legislative uh, devolved legislature to withhold consent. The absence of this direct procedural link between consent decisions and processes in the Westminster Parliament is a definite weakness of the process. But overall, it has its benefits. In practice, the main thing about Seoul is that it delivers practical benefits for both the UK and devolved governments. If we just go on to the next slide here. Um, thank you. It provides a simple way to ensure that the law is consistent across the UK in technical areas where there's no political disagreement about a single UK-wide legal framework. For instance, in January 2020, consent was given to the Direct Payment to Farmers Bill, which created a framework for support payments to farmers after they lost access to EU funding. On other occasions, UK-wide legislation passed with consent can be the best way to um, ensure consistent compliance with international obligations. So if you remember the Domestic Abuse Act, um, that ensured that courts across the UK are compliant with the Istanbul Convention on Domestic Violence. The legislative consent process can play a particularly useful role in where there's uncertainty about what is and what isn't devolved. Basically, so long as there is agreement on the substantial policy questions, then Sewell allows legislation to be enacted without needing to resolve that tricky question of where competence lies, prevents legislation from going to court very often, and it's also a convenient time saver from the perspective of devolved governments. It's no wonder then that it has been used far more than predicted when established. In its first 20 years, it was used to facilitate the passage of more than 200 Acts of Parliament. This included 65 bills for Northern Ireland, which presumably would have been more if the executive had been consistently functioning. Overall, you can see that bills subject to consent motions have most frequently fallen within the remit of the Home Office, Bays, and the Ministry of Justice. Now, on to, if we go on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, before 2018, consent had actually only been withheld by one or other of the devolved legislatures on just nine occasions, which you can see on this chart. The Northern Ireland Assembly withheld consent only once for the Enterprise Bill in 2015, which concerned a cap on public sector exit payments. In this case, the UK government agreed to amend the legislation so that the provision on payments no longer applied in Northern Ireland. So with just a handful of exceptions, the legislative consent process operated in the way that it was intended, as a facilitator of cooperation and a guarantee of devolved political autonomy. However, as Akash has already mentioned, Brexit put this process under considerable strain and bills were passed for the first time without consent. So over to Akash now for a discussion on our recommendations on how to strengthen this convention if it is to survive. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, so, 
as we have heard, um, it's of course Brexit primarily that has called into question the uh, the status of the Seal Convention. So I do now want to talk through uh, some of our recommendations for what could be done. Um, our analysis and uh, our proposals are, I should say, targeted principally at Westminster and Whitehall rather than uh, how the LCM process should function here in the Northern Ireland Assembly or indeed in Edinburgh and Cardiff. However, a central point that we make is that there should be a stronger, more formal connection between what happens at the devolved le level and what happens at Westminster uh, during the passage of legislation where, where cons the consent issue arises. And so the reforms that we suggest do rely to some extent upon process being followed in, in a proper way at the devolved level in order that views from Belfast and Edinburgh and Cardiff can be more systematically fed into proceedings at Westminster in the way that we think they should be. And I, I know that this is, um, of course, the, the, the issue that you are grappling with, how to ensure that the processes are um, followed when, when legislation um, that falls within the scope of the convention comes forward. So I'll be really interested in your thoughts as a committee as to how our conclusions align with or, or hopefully mutually support um, conclusions that you yourselves might, uh, might reach as part of this inquiry. Um, so what we propose, um, and of course the full detail is in the report, um, but in brief, is a set of reforms at each stage of the consent process. First of all, we think there needs to be a clarification of the scope of the Sewell Convention, because what we've seen over recent years is an attempt by the UK government to narrow the scope of the convention um, such that it is claimed that there's no need to seek consent for bills that amend the powers of the devolved institutions. And, and, and that strikes us, um, and certainly a point that's been made by uh, Welsh and Scottish governments as well, um, as, a, as a threat to, to, to devolved autonomy. So, so we think that should be addressed. Second, we say there needs to be better pre-legislative consultation between UK government departments and the devolved administrations, um, including a requirement that legislation is shared in draft a few weeks before introduction into Parliament. As Kelly's mentioned, there is government guidance about how this process should work, um, but it is not always followed, and, and that does lead to problems. Third, we suggest that at the point of introduction of a bill into Parliament, it should be accompanied by what we call a devolution statement or a devolution impact statement, you could think of it as, as well, uh, which would set out whether and why the bill requires consent from the different uh, devolved legislatures, how the Whitehall Department responsible has engaged with devolved counterparts during the policy process to try and iron out any issues, and whether there are um, unresolved disputes and, and, and how the government intends to kind of uh, to, 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 to deal with those. There could also be a requirement that for such a bill that does require consent, it and the accompanying devolution statement should be referred to the devolved legislatures directly, for instance, via correspondence between the chief clerks or maybe the, the, the speakers and presiding officers. Um, and I mean, this is then a matter, obviously, for, 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 for you in within the assembly, but these could then be referred to appropriate committees to consider and, and report upon, even in advance of or in lieu of um, the executive publishing a legislative consent memorandum, which I know does not always happen. Fourth, we suggest that at Westminster, a UK uh, a parliamentary committee, perhaps a new dedicated devolution committee, should be tasked with scrutinising any such bill and the accompanying devolution statement and then reporting to Parliament on how the bill affects devolution. And this committee could also seek advice, legal advice, um, in cases where it is disputed as to whether consent is required, which, which does occur um, 
actually more frequently than people realize because of uh, that lack of clarity sometimes about where the boundary between reserved and devolved matters lies. Um, also, very importantly, as part of this process, the new committee, we suggest, should take evidence from devolved um, from the devolved administrations, but also potentially from, from committees of the devolved legislatures, uh, whether verbally or, or just in terms of written submissions, in order that the committee can um, then report to Parliament uh, based on as full a picture as possible of how the bill is perceived to affect devolution um, in, in all parts of the UK. Fifth, and finally, we suggest that if the government in certain exceptional circumstances wants to proceed in the absence of consent, then a minister should give a statement to each house setting out the reasons why it believes this is an appropriate course of action. Um, and there should then also be an additional stage of the legislative process at which each house debates and votes on the specific question of whether to proceed without consent. Um, which at the moment can happen almost without people noticing that that is what, hap what is happening. And as part of that, it would, of course, be crucial to ensure that any dis consent decisions and relevant reports and so on from devolved legislature committees are put on the record and taken into account. So that, again, does rely upon um, rely upon processes being followed in, 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 the, in the normal way at the devolved level. Our recommendations, I should add in uh, conclusion, are designed to operate within the existing constitutional framework, including, therefore, the ultimate sovereignty of the UK Parliament. There are people, of course, who'd, who'd want to go further um, and impose binding constraints on the UK Parliament, something more like a, a federal system, uh, perhaps. Um, there are arguments in favour of that, but what we tried to do was to set out reforms that could be conceivably implemented relatively quickly if there were political uh, will at uh, both UK and, and devolved levels. And we do believe that if they were implemented, our reforms would imp would improve how the process works by strengthening relations between the different institutions, by sharpening accountability of, of ministers um, in the UK government, by making it clearer when the UK Parliament is legislating in devolved areas, and by increasing awareness within Westminster of how what it does impacts on devolved issues, and also then pro by providing new channels for communication between Westminster and the devolved bodies. So um, that brings us to the end of our uh, presentation, and we're now very interested in your thoughts and questions. Okay, thank you, Cash and Kelly, for your presentation. Um, so I'm going to throw it over to members for or for questions first. So, Emery, I can't see everyone on my screen. Um, Sinead currently has her hands up. Okay, Sinead, go for it. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Uh, thanks to Akish and uh, Kelly for your presentation. I suppose um, I'm one of those people that would like to take it further, but I also appreciate um, the the parameters that you you know you presented your report in and and the solution mode that that you are trying to achieve in terms of a lot of the problems that we experience, um, particularly at committee level, um, where timing is a huge issue. And I suppose that is one of the uh, things I would like to see formalised in a better way. And I appreciate there will be legislative pieces that um, it can be very difficult uh, to pin down a timing structure on it. But it, it is almost an insult to say to a devolved institution, um, we are still going through the procedure of a legislative consent motion, although we've reached the point in our legislative programme where we've already... Um, had that binding effect, and and I think that there are uh, cases where it, it doesn't help with relations. Let's just put it mildly, mm -hmm. um, and and that you did speak to that. But one of the other things I would be very conscious of, um, and whilst I I'm never happy, you know, if if it can, if any legislation can be carried out in the devolved institution, that will always be on every day of the week my first choice. 
Um, but I do see, and I and particularly Brexit and even um, COVID, I suppose, in, in some parts, but there, so there are situations where you know we wanted our farmers to get their money as quickly as possible or our fisheries, and, and you can see that, and we won't be cutting our nose off to spread our face. And um, so I suppose we do recognize that that will have to happen on occasion. But at the very least, what I see also missing in this is Sometimes you will charge on, but not only do the devolved institutions not get an opportunity to give a timely expression of their view, stakeholders are completely out of the equation. So where is the peace in the Westminster thread that if they're ramming through or pushing through, maybe for good reason, but where is the peace where the stakeholders are given an opportunity to give a voice. And I just think as as we're being rushed through process, we're trying to desperately engage with stakeholders to make sure that there is an expression of their view. Mm. But very often, those people who will affect the most don't get to speak. And I would like to see that firmly um, set into your parameters. But thank you. Appreciate. Um, I genuinely appreciate this is a helpful, a helpful paper. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Um, Amy, are there any other members wanting to ask questions? No hands raised, Carol. Okay. Um, could I also just ask a few questions? Fully support what Sinead has said. Um, but, I mean, the SEAL Convention, you know, if it's working well as it is, or, you know, I mean, what, how would you strengthen? accountability from the British government to the devolved institutions other than, I mean, you've put out very helpful recommendations, um, but what is your feedback in relation to if those recommendations are actually going to be properly considered? Because there's, there's obviously a uh, disconsent across all the devolved institutions regarding this. And the point that Sinead has made is coming back to us all time and time again, not only as members of the Legislative Assembly, are we not given enough time to scrutinise? Mm. But certainly stakeholders um, and different sectors um, aren't given notice either. And it feels a wee bit colonial. And it's my words, it's not the committee's, but still feel, feels a wee bit colonial. And I think it needs to be knocked in the head. I'm sure it's a better way of putting it. But so what other than the recommendations that you've laid out what would you, um, as the Institute, um, would further consider um, should be included in the reform of the legislative uh, consent motion process? Okay, yeah, thanks Thanks very much for those uh, questions. Um, on the, the, the timing issue, um, I mean, that I, I, I appreciate um, that that is a, a frustration um, at the... At the, the at the level of the assembly, when bills may suddenly be rushed through, and it's not clear exactly how long you may have to consider the consent issues, and at what point um, it therefore makes sense for you to you know to to to, to look at the bill and to report on them and so on. Um, it's quite hard for us to. To, to, to find a kind of simple solution to that, because the UK government is always going to quite jealously guard its own control of its legislative um, programme. And as you say, I mean, there's, there are going to be circumstances in which, with the best will in the world, there, there's going to be an urgent reason to press through legislation. But I, I totally agree with you that um, what happens is is that legislation is, is rushed through it hasn't been shared in advance, as we said, with the devolved uh, governments, um, often because there's issues between Whitehall departments that take a long time to iron out, and um, there's an unwillingness to engage externally, even with devolved counterparts, until basically Whitehall has, has reached a position, and, and then a bill can be um, kind of rushed out uh, late in the day, and, and that does absolutely squeeze... Um, the opportunity for, for devolved views to be taken into account. I think what I would say is that, I mean, what our recommendations are, are designed to do, among other things, is to, is to improve transparency and create 
a process or a set of processes and reporting requirements that would at least make it clearer when the government hasn't consulted properly. Um, there would be, you know, if, if the package, and I'll come on to your question about the politics of, uh, you know, whether any, any of this is likely, but if the, our package of reforms were to be implemented or some, something similar, I, I think I, what that would lead to is um, there'd be a debate and consideration in Westminster that would be more informed by and more um, m more in tune with what was going on at the devolved level. Because what, what happens at the moment is it can be very easily overlooked. You know, there may be Scottish or Welsh or uh, MPs from Northern Ireland who get up in a debate and, and make points about consent hasn't been given or has the House considered... Um, these implications for for the devolved um, institutions, but it doesn't happen in a systematic and formal way. And I think if you were to do something along the lines of what we suggest, both in terms of proper reporting from the government on the devolution issues, and then better scrutiny by a by a committee in Westminster, which would then coordinate or communicate with devolved counterparts, I think that would start to help reduce the impact of that problem. Um, I hope that makes sense. In terms of uh, your, your, your question, Chet, on the is any of this likely to happen? Well, I don't think the government is interested particularly in any reforms that it would see as imposing new process and new constraints on its freedom of ac action. That's just the, the, the simple reality. Um, we did speak to people in, in government about it. And, yeah, I mean, I think... Um, that, that this isn't something we expect them to endorse in the short term. However, I think more generally at Westminster, there's a growing realisation that um, the process as it, as it exists isn't fit for purpose and, and, and something needs to be done. So I know you've been in touch with the House of Commons Procedure Committee. We've spoken with them as well, and they're looking at this issue. So to the, the, the House of Lords Constitution Committee. So I feel like over time we would hope to build a, a, a wider sort of coalition of, of, of support in favour of, of some of these reforms. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's, it is what it is, but at, at the end of the day, you know, uh, there is, I think there's an acknowledgement that changes need to happen, but the pace of change hasn't landed yet. Um, and I think it's just going to be a process that people from each of the assemblies or each of the devolved institutions are going to continually raise. Uh, but I don't, I just don't know what impact that will have. And we did speak to the um, the procedures committee as well. Um, um, but uh, I mean, beyond courtesy, I don't know what impact that will have either. Um, Emer, I just want to check if any other members want to ask any questions or observations. No hands raised. Okay. Well, can I offer um, members of the committee an opportunity even to come back at a later stage because we can feed this through um, and even just any information you have, we'd really appreciate it if you could share it because I, I found it really beneficial, uh, very contemporary, um, and it certainly reflects a lot of concerns that we would have had if you'd have been given the opportunity. So I want to thank both of you um, for your attendance and indeed your work um, and just keep going. So thank you. Thanks so much for having us. It's been a pleasure. No bother. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Akash. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so um, so we'll consider a draft response to the House of Commons party at a future meeting. Can I just ask everybody if you're not speaking to you put yourselves on mute? There's a lot of echoing, please. I think that's a lot better. Um, so, Emer has requested further information from our researchers, and in respect to the third aspect of the inquiry, which is um, seeking views on the procedural steps required to facilitate greater joint working between committees of each of the UK devolved and legislators and House of Commons. So, I mean, we've already got that in train. 
Um, Emir, is there anything else that we need to do on that issue? No, that's the third aspect of the House of Commons inquiry, and hopefully Rays will present at the meeting on the 2nd of June. Okay, so Rays will brief us in, in respect of all that um, um, at the 2nd of June meeting. So um, I want to refer you on to page 18 of uh, your PACs and Amherst paper, and this paper is a note of the discussion we had indeed um, Tom and I were at the committee with the uh, House of Commons Procedures Committee. So are you content to note this or do members have any further questions regarding this meeting or anything else in relation to this, this issue? No, everybody's content. Okay. So um, at page 71, um, so it's item... Agenda item five, it's the NDNA simultaneous interpretation. Um, and to remind us all that following the briefing from the Assembly officials um, to us, we asked for additional information on a number of issues. So at page 71 is a paper from Memer, and at page 74 is response from the Assembly officials. You will also have seen from the table papers that we got as well as response in relation to the NDNA commitments, a response from Deirdre, the Minister for Communities, regarding an update in sign language bill. And the Minister has indeed confirmed that a bill will not be introduced in the current mandate. So I just want to ask members, are they content to note the correspondence from the Minister? Um, or are there any questions regarding this? Uh, I mean, we've got Gareth, Simon, and Susie here. Um, if you are asking any additional questions, more so on the simultaneous translation or interpretation. That's why they're here. So first of all, can I ask you just to note the correspondence from Deirdre? Okay, noted. Uh, go on, i for that. So we've got Gareth, Simon and Susie here um, in relation to the simultaneous interpretation. And what we need to do is to seek your views on whether provision for this interpretation should be made available in the Assembly. So you may remember we had a couple of options. Um, and we're looking at um, if we are agreeing that there is a simultaneous interpretation, then there are a number of issues that we need to consider. So, you know, we discussed, and I still feel it's a bit convoluted, but should it be active or passive? Should it be simultaneous or consecutive? Should it be spontaneous or by agreement? Um, and so that's A, and then B, as part of the decision making, we need to seek the views on whether it's con we are content that the Assembly Commission should determine any other necessary arrangements in relation to how such, well, how this system would work in consultation with the um, the committee were appropriate. So um, I'm going to open it up for members for questions. For, like, first of all, um, Emer, it might be worth bringing, it might be worth reminding people what is active or passive, what is simultaneous or consecutive, what is spontaneous. Um, if we could do that before we move to decisions, please. Do you want me to run through that, Chair, or would you like me to bring up Simon and Susie? Well, yeah. Well, whoever can make it straightforward, so we might have thrown up and kick okay. it back to you. Um, happy to be corrected. So an active is where any language spoken would be translated automatically into all of the other languages. So if someone is speaking in Irish or Ulster Scots, there would be a translation going on back into English and into the uh, alternative language, whereas passive is... Uh, if you remember, Simon discussed at the last meeting the fact that there is an assumption made in other legislatures that there's nobody who just functions in English, no monoglots. Everyone understands, or, or nobody just functions in another language. Everyone understands English. So, um, and that's the system and the approach that has been taken in Wales, in Scotland, and currently in the Arctic. So, and um, that's what passive is. It means that it would be translated into. Um, one other language rather than all of them. Okay. Simultaneous is um, what goes on, it's at the same time as, whereas uh -huh. consecutive would be, would 
involve stopping and starting. So somebody would finish a sentence and then it would follow. Yeah. Um, and spontaneous is live. So as it happens, what currently is facilitatable in the chamber at the minute with the booths, whereas by arrangement would be maybe, for example, um, indicated in advance via the business committee or the business office um, or committees to committees if it was go if a member chose or was planning to speak or receive evidence in another language, then that would be by arrangement. And then the last item in terms of how broad an audience is about whether or not it needs to be fed through to broadcasting, would it be to all committee members? Would it be in the hands art? It's it's much um it's how wide um a remit would the translation the simultaneous interpretation then need to go. So I'm correct in saying Umer, that the minute is spontaneous and it's in the hands art. That's that's what that's what happens at the minute. Yes, and at the minute, um, Simon can keep me right. It's generally greetings or introductions or endings rather than full discourse. Uh huh. Um, so at the minute, what happens is simultaneous and and passive on those occasions where an alternative language is used. Okay. So I'm going to open it up to members for comment. Jerry has his hand raised. And we've got Jerry, we've got Tom. Who else is in after that? Sinead. So Jerry, Tom, Sinead. Jerry, go ahead. Thanks, sir. Uh, thanks, Seymour. Um, Simon, I suppose yourself, maybe just a, a question. I mean, I know Wales is normally held as, as the model for sort of smaller minority languages, um, certainly sort of UK and, and, and Ireland. Um, uh, has there been any uh, consultation with sort of Irish language organisations, Simon, either by yourself or or other bodies in, in the assembly to try and ascertain, you know, what is the best uh, approach in terms of, you know, promoting the language, obviously, but also being sort of practical within um, within Stormont and this mandate. So, do you aware of any uh, consultation in that regard? You made a said last week, but I think I missed that. Um, so, just a bit of clarity on that would be helpful. Thanks. Uh, Chair, uh, we've spoken with the other legislatures. Jerry, we haven't spoken with, uh, at least we haven't in Hansard, where the service sort of has resided. We haven't spoken with any other language bodies because, in a sense, we haven't a lot to speak to them about. Um, uh, if, you, if you understand me there, um, we need to steer as to, as to, what, as, 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 as to what the Assembly wishes. Uh, to provide, and then it'll be our duty to go and provide that. Um, uh, so we haven't, we, but as I say, we have talked with the houses of the Arachis. Indeed, I had an email from their head of the translation unit last night, which was very helpful. And we've talked with Wales uh, about how interpreting could and should be provided. We will, we, we will, sorry, I should add, I mean, once we, if a decision is made and, and we need to ramp up, what we have we will undoubtedly have to talk to organisations somewhere along the way because you'll have seen in the paper from Gareth that um, we have some concerns, but we won't know whether they are, are realistically based or not, uh, whether there are sufficient people out there to provide such a service until we go to market. And at that stage, we will have a series of, of discussions uh, with all sorts of stakeholders, I imagine. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just quickly, Chair, just uh, I think the reason why I asked was obviously, you know, we're to determine the sort of procedures and, and how obviously the, the assembly functions, but people who are sort of experts in the language uh, would maybe pick up potential uh, issues that could emerge. So uh, I think it would be worthwhile doing that as, as soon as possible, but I appreciate uh, those comments, Simon. That's me for now. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. So we've got Tom, Sinead and Gary after that. So Tom, over to yourself. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. And again on this issue, <clears throat> and I think, yeah, it's a commitment within the NDNA, as there are a number of other uh, commitments uh, in the NDNA. And I think members will all appreciate that this very sensitive issue in a number of ways. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we, can, or we can all um, stand back and say it's politically sensitive, but it's also maybe financially sensitive at this particular time as well in bringing something like this forward. 
uh, and they we, we see later on the paper about the uh, costs associated with it. We, we did talk about that uh, last week, or sorry, the last meeting, and uh, we, we take all that on board. And and maybe to me this seems to be as if we're for I suppose an expression on my part of the world where you're putting the carrot in front of the horse. And I think what we need to do maybe, and I would like to see this been um, passed over to the party leaders forum so that we have a clear understanding that the, the parties within the, uh, within the assembly and within the executive are content for this to be brought forward at this particular moment in time. Uh, you know, as, as at the moment in time that we're bringing forward, these are all issues that that are to be uh, needs to be um, threshed out, if you like, as to what type of a system we want, uh, and and whether well, we want a spontaneous or passive or whatever. That's all part of the process and bringing it forward. But I think before this is brought forward, we need a clear understanding from within the committee that this is something that that, that, that obviously. The party leaders are, are satisfied with uh, to bring it forward at this particular moment in time, and that is why that you know I I would be happy to propose that this uh, we we refer this to the party leaders forum uh, and and ask them to uh, consider this and then to come back to us, and then we would know then and would be in a better position to know that whenever we would, whenever if it was their uh, agreement that this was the time to take this forward, that at least whatever we were doing, it wouldn't be something that would be lost, but it's something that the committee would be doing and would be taking it forward knowing that they had the support of the party leaders from the party leaders forum on it. And, uh, Chair, I would um, I would make that a proposal, uh, obviously, to, to, to put it in that direction at this moment in time. One other thing I would like um, perhaps maybe uh, Emer to do, if the committee were in agreement with this, and that is that within NDNA there are a number of commitments uh, or a number of issues within the NDNA of which culture and language is one of them. Uh, but th there are a number of other issues that, that the committee, that w w this committee that we're in, may well have some responsibility for uh, seeing to be brought forward. Not. And I'm just wondering, could a paper be done on what other commitments are there or issues within the NDNA that our committee would be responsible for and seeking to bring through, as well as this one on the culture and languages? And I, I know I would need the, your indulgence, Chair, and I would need the your agreement of the committee on that if that were uh, if that were to be agreed on. Thank you. So, Tom, you've made a proposal. I'm going to come back to it at the end to get a second, but I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to yes. speak. And then we can go back to it. Oh, is that okay? That's so fantastic. good stuff, Tom. Thanks. So Sinead, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I appreciate Simon being here. Um, I suppose I'm just trying to find the, the logic in the sequencing of what's happening here. And you know, wearing purely my uh, procedures committee hat in terms of is it the role of the procedures crit? You know, it's quite clear and it stipulates quite clearly. It's not open for interpretation what was agreed in the new decade, new approach. So I presume um, that, in a way, um, Tom, is the expression of um, leaders. But I do take your point about in this moment in time. You know, obviously a lot has happened and currently is ongoing um, since that new decade, new approach priority was set. But what I would ask is... Do we, as a procedures committee, write the procedure in or draft a procedure in? And then, Simon, as you referred to it, then we hand over, I presume, to the commission, who will be charged with um, deciding on what they're going to put in place, what tendering they're going to go out to, um, and then, as Simon put it, go to market and find out, you know, they have a wish list of what they might hope to put in place, go to market and find the reality of what can be put in place. And is there a danger that we as a procedures committee have jumped ahead and we've created procedures that won't fit what's actually going to be deliverable? And is our place not after the pace with the commission? where we say this is what they're able to present and realistically put on offer. And therefore, we then need to write procedures that will accommodate that, even if the procedures are more ambitious, obviously, to fill gaps as and when, you know, that um, 
the, the full package could be delivered. So I'd just be interested to know Simon's view in terms of, you know, the would you be looking at the, um, I suppose, the procedures at the beginning or at the end of this process as your lead? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to bring uh, Gareth and he's had his hands up yeah. uh, speaking this, so just yes. a sequencing out, Gareth, if you don't mind. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sinead, in terms of the sequencing, it, it, it would very much be the case that it is for the committee and for the Assembly to decide um, what it wants in terms of the, the standing orders and the service to be provided, and then it's for the Commission to provide that service. Now, obviously, it is broadly sequential, but I'm sure um, subject to the committee and the assembly's consideration, there might be questions about 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 uh, detail of it. But it's very much for the committee and the assembly to decide what it wants first, and then the statutory responsibility of the commission is to provide that service. Okay, so my understanding, Garth, is that currently we've already got the starting order there, so we don't need to change starting orders. Correct. We, what we need to do is work out. Do we keep what we have at the minute, which is simultaneous and passive? Okay. Uh, and what we need, if we get, for example, if that's agreed today, then Susie and Gareth, or Susie and Simon, will know what recommendation they need to put to the Commission in order to trigger the spend. Is that it? That, that's correct, yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Gary. Sinead, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. It, it does give clarity on that, and I appreciate that because it's known at what point the Commission yeah. came up, and I understand the standing orders there, but I just wondered, you know, could we be creating something that's not deliverable? Yeah. Um, then do we revisit that, or do we just set that ambitious piece in? Do we leave it in standing orders as a target, or that it's always in scope? You know? no, well, the standing orders there, so regardless, so it's already done, so that but of work's already done. Um, but because the NDNA has obviously came well after the Stanton Order, uh, which included um, interpretation, simultaneous interpretation, what the Commission need to know from us is what sort of interpretation are we going to ask or agree upon in order so they can go out to market. It's, it's as crude as that. Yeah. Sorry, but that's... that's yeah. That's my understanding of it. Yeah. And to be fair, Chair, that was just that was stipulated, wasn't it? The wording of the um new decade new approach agreement did Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, removed it from us if our job is to deliver on that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Gary, you're in next. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um Obviously, some of the questions I was going to ask have been answered. I think uh, Gareth's paper was, was useful. It certainly provided uh, clarity. Um, a few things, I suppose, concern me, and, and Sinead actually touched on one of them. And I, I don't know if I'm completely convinced by the answer that been said. Um, one of the points was around you know the, the, the Assembly Commission has not yet been briefed or, or even considered um, any additional uh Reinforcing requests for this matter. Now, Gareth, I, I do take the point around, um, you know, it's for the Assembly to instruct, but, you know, I, I think it's a bit of a, a cart before the horse situation and that, you know, the Assembly Commission will be those uh, responsible for uh, putting in bids for additional resource. So maybe, as I say, I, I do take your response, but I still just don't get the, the logic behind that. The, the other point that I want to raise is just in relation to the financial spend. Obviously, my reading of it, is around the new decade, new approach commitment was around Irish and Ulster Scots. Uh, the paper highlights the interpretation of two languages um, for one meeting. The minimum spend there would be well just under four hundred and fifty thousand uh, pounds. Uh, for one language, it would be one hundred and seventy-two. Obviously, that wouldn't be. Um, well, that wouldn't be looked at because the new decade, new approach is for uh, both. Um, so, so I think that, you know, as I say, we're talking here in around 350 or 344,000 uh, pounds additional resource required. Uh, obviously, the paper also raises concerns around recruitment. And I note that the, 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 the houses of the Oireachtas, uh, their recent competition, they were unable to, to fill the, the, the requests that they had put out. Uh, so I think there's a concerns around recruitment. And, and obviously, we heard last 
two weeks ago around concerns around Ulster Scots recruitment as well. So I think that that's a concern uh, right across the board. Uh, that being said, I suppose you won't know until you, you test the market. So so I accept that. I, I would uh, very much agree with Tom's uh, proposal. I think, and I'm happy to second uh, Tom's proposal. Uh, I think this is an issue which needs to be uh, taken to the likes of a party leaders forum. Um, I think that uh, as we implement the new decade, new approach, one of the, the key mechanisms, uh, and certainly one of the reasons uh, that, that, that um, you know I uh, recognise the need for the new decade, new approach, was about bringing it all together in, in one uh, fashion. I think that's very, very important. So that piece of work uh, for, for Emer, I think, is very, very important. We need to see all of the commitments, uh, and they need to be brought forward in one go. Um, so uh, say I'm happy to second Tom's proposal in that respect. Okay. So I've got Morris next and then I've got Rosemary. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I think Tom and, and Gary have raised the concerns and I, I, would, I would support them in that. But, uh, to make a decision, you've got to have all the information and I have the keen uh, for Simon to share the information that he got from the Iraqis in, the, in, the, in Sinead uh, in Wales with the committee members so that we could maybe be more informed as to what they are doing in other legislators, legislations in other places. Would that be possible, Simon, that we could have it? doesn't necessarily have to wait until the next meeting, but we could have it between now and the next meeting as an information piece. Um, 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 in a sense, we've, we've provided sort of the, uh, an overview of what happens in the other two places that Gareth has in this paper and in the previous paper. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what more information uh, that that we can offer. At the, I mean, if there was something specific, Morris, we, we certainly could, but we, we, we know that roughly the size of, of the pools of people we have. We know the money that they pay them. We know roughly the way they work. Um, you know, so that information is to hand, and, and really, I think we've put it in the papers already. Now, okay. We can get as much detail as, as we possibly yeah. can, but the, yeah. the basis of it is there. Yeah, the basis of it is there. Um, so, uh, let's kind of bring uh, more. Sorry, you finished? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Are you all right, Morris? Did you break any windows, sir? I <laughs> All right, okay. Well, Morris, it's cheaper to replace a window than it is an iPhone. Listen, I'm going to, I'm going to bring uh, Rosemary in. Thank and, you. Thank you very much. I'm also going to bring Garth in after you, Rosemary, okay? Okay, quite a few of the questions that I had in mind had been answered, has been answered. Yep, I think I think we need to look at the party leaders. We need to maybe involve them in helping make a decision or look at it or bring it to their attention anyway in relation to the in relation to the languages. With regard to the Commission, I, I'm afraid I must agree with Sinead there. I think we've got to it would be worthwhile maybe discussing this with the Commission with the Commissioner to make sure that, that um, we are we're working in tandem and working together to have this together. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, uh, Gareth, do you want to come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. So just an, and again, I suppose to go back to the, the sequencing, um, I mean, there are three parties in this relationship. Um, if I could put it that way, there is the, the, the committee, the assembly and the commission. And the, the commission needs to be given the authority under Section 40 of the, the Northern Ireland Act to do something. Um, and that authority comes from uh, from the assembly via a, a motion suitably worded uh, under under section 40 so there are there are three parties and obviously the role of of the committee is to look at well how will this work um and and the, and, uh, and what we've provided in the paper is a is a, a, an estimate of the cost to inform um the committee's thinking and if i could just go back to um there was a in relation to the the one language or uh, two languages. I think there's a there's a nuanced point there in terms of passive, and I've set that out at paragraph twenty of the the paper. Um, 
And I, and I suppose I've been quite blunt and I've said, whilst it may be a statement of the obvious, a passive Ulster Scots interpretation service is not currently required uh, b- because there are no speakers at that uh, at this point in time. Active, of course, is a, is a very different matter. Um, but, uh, but at this stage, uh, uh, I'm not aware of, and, and there has been, um, as Simon has said elsewhere in the paper, there's been no use of, of Ulster Scots other than the odd colloquialism um, since Jim Shannon left the Assembly a number of years ago. Um, Gareth, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, Emer, has anyone else indicated? I think Nicola has indicated. Yes, sorry. Go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Um, listen, thank you, Gareth and Simon and Susie. Um, that's clarified a lot there. I think, as I said, the last uh, the, our last meeting, this um, service has, has been long overdue. So I would actually like to propose that we do go ahead with simultaneous and passive translation. I think it's time that we do. So that that's my proposal for today. Thanks. Okay, and Sinead, you're looking back in as well. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I suppose it's um, one thing agreeing, but I'm looking down the list, and thank you, Gareth. That procedural part was really made clear when you talked about the three actors and the, you know, the process. So the motion that would have to go to the assembly that, that would trigger the um, commission then taking action in terms of then the wording of that motion. Um, because because I do hear other colleagues here, and I, and I genuinely do hear their concerns. Is there room in that motion or the wording of that motion that we could ask that they liaise with the um, with the leaders group? Well, because that, yeah, you know, that would be something uh, that we could put into the motion that would maybe satisfy the concerns here. Thank you. Um, yeah, because I think you know there's two proposals here, Sinead and everybody else. We're going to have to vote on both. And then depending on what the outcome is, there needs to be a motion drafted. Um, and at that stage, um, it will have to go to the Assembly in order for the Commission under Section 40 to be able to do anything. So, I mean, it's, that's has always been the way this committee has worked. So apologies if I've left that out. Jerry, you're looking in. Yeah, Jerry, I was just going to second Nicola's, uh, Nicola's uh, motion proposal. Okay, so thank you for that. So, um, Tom, do you want to, since you made the first proposal and uh, Gary has seconded it, can we um, just get the wording of your proposal? Um, Because to be fair to everybody, I think it's just coming down to two proposals. I think we've got as much information as we need and we've had, I think, without prejudice of chair in the meeting. I think everybody's been given a fair opportunity to have their view. So um, unless anybody has a third proposal, I would just like Tom to um, repeat what his proposal is um, and then we can just put that to a vote and then we can get Nicola to repeat her proposal and then we'll put that to a vote. Is that okay? Okay. Um, Thank you, you, Chair. The proposal Proposal is quite simple that we pass this to the uh, party leaders forum for uh, their consideration. Okay, and Gary has seconded that. So, um, Emer, is this the first vote we've ever had in the committee? Steve, you started Tom Buchanan. You started murder. <laughs> <laughs> so, Emer. What's a crash? What are we doing? Can I, can I just ask for broadcasting to move to the grid screen, please, and for any officials to turn off the camera? Oh, okay. So can I ask members if you're raising your hand um, for the motion to raise it up beside your face, if possible? So first of all, for the for the proposal of passing to party leaders forum for their consideration, those in favour? Gary, Tom and Rosemary, thank you. And those against? Sorry, Morris, your camera wasn't on there. Can I start with you? Say to be fair, Emer, I prefer you done that again. Okay. And um, so for the proposal from Tom uh, for passing the issue to the party leader forum for their consideration, those four. 
Rosemary, Tom, Morris, and Gary. And those against? Carl, Jerry, Nicola, Sinead. And Linda. And Linda. So that is carried, that is against? Yes. Not, not carried. Okay. The second proposal? Yeah, I propose that the committee uh, moves ahead with the simultaneous and passive um, interpretation service. Simultaneous and passive interpretation. Yeah. First of all, those four. Carol, Linda, Jerry, Nicola, Sinead. And those against? Rosemary, Tom, Morris, Gary. Thank you. That is carried. Second proposal carried. Thank you. Okay. So the next stage is um, what will, will, I mean, like to be fair, this is going to go to party leaders anyway, because it's not going to go on to the assembly and the party leaders have absolutely, have no doubt We'll be having this discussion, but I don't think, I mean, it, that, I mean we took a vote and that's it. Um, what I think we need to do is, if, Emer, we can now look at drafting a motion. Emer, you're on mute. Pardon me. Sorry, Chair. There's a second part to there, there be a motion passed, which was seeking the committee's view on whether it was content that the Assembly Commission would determine any other necessary arrangements. Well, and then um, I would propose to go away and draft a motion, which would come back to the next meeting of the... Yes, I, I think we need to do that because we've discussed a lot. So what we need to do is a draft motion based on the vote and then whatever else the Commission feels it needs. If that needs to be drafted, there's a motion to come back to it again. Is that far enough, people? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Um. And Jerry just has his hand raised, Carol. Who, Jerry? Gary. Gary, sorry, Gary, go for it. No, no, Chair, it was just a point of clarification. See the vote that was just taken in relation to the passive simultaneous? Yeah. Is, is that, I, I appreciate that it's going to be now, uh, a, a motion will come forward and that it would be a matter for the Assembly Commission, but just to clarify, that proposal was based on two languages. Is that what the proposal is based on? Um, no, it's not, Garth. Um, going by your paper, it's well. No, it was just for Irish because at the minute, there, the the a commission and the speaker's office haven't determined that there's any Ulster Scott speakers in the assembly. However, my understanding is, should that change, then that facility will have to be catered for. To be honest, Gary, it's exactly what we'll have at the minute. The only difference is here, everybody getting headsets in the assembly. That's the only difference here. But Gareth will no. open you in for Wiser Council. Uh, yeah, yeah, Chair, um, I, I never want to split hairs given my lack of it. But um, again, it's a bit of a nuanced point that NDNA said, NDNA refers explicitly both to Ulster Scots and to Irish. Yeah. Yes. And, and therefore, without wanting to put words in the mouth of the committee, therefore, the motion, if it were to reflect NDNA, would would include provision for both Irish and okay. for Ulster Scots. Yes. Um, but um, I suppose, as I highlighted to the committee earlier, paragraph 23 of the paper says that at the moment, um, whilst that service would, would be required to be provided by the commission currently, um, there are there we're not aware of any Ulster Scots speakers, so that, that would be a matter that would have to be considered. However, if Gary, just for talk's sake, if Gary, Tom, Rosemary, and Morris went into the chamber in a couple of weeks' time and decided to do their opening remarks or concluding remarks in Ulster Scots, then they're entitled to that facility, just as I would if I'd done the same thing in Irish. Yes. Uh, well, um, uh, yes, um, although I, I do just, um, I think it was your reference to a couple of weeks' time that threw me because I think no. there's... Yeah. Okay, well, whenever, 
whenever, whenever the service is up and running. Yeah, so what you're saying, basically what I'm saying is if there's a demand and there's a need, then there yes. will be supply. It's as yes. as, okay, okay. Yeah. Gary, does that answer your question? Well, I'm glad he came in, Chair, because with all due respect, you said it was just for Irish, which then isn't true. It, it, it's for both. So I think it's just important that we know uh, what what people have voted for. Yeah. And it's important that we know when the motion comes back, we need to then reflect on how that, because I think, and I'm not for one minute suggesting you're doing this, Chair, but it is important that when you look at the new decade and the approach that we don't cherry pick and single out specific issues that we want to further. We, we need to bring it and we need to look at it collectively. But I do appreciate the, uh, the, the clarification um, that you've given and through, through Gareth as well. So thank well, you. See, just for clarity, I knew the new decade and the approach was for both, Gary, so I'm not being dismissive or anything. I was just taking... And I mean, I have never been disrespectful, so I just want to put that on the record. I was taking the nuance in Gar's paper, and that's why I added the emphasis to make sure that people feel there isn't disrespect or there's a lack of equity there. Um, and and the second proposal that Tom made, which I want to come back to you if we've concluded in this item, um, I want to come back to it at the end because it was the ask for a list of all outstanding NDNA commitments because. If you remember, we've been asking about this at nauseam, and TO haven't bothered themselves getting back to us, to be frank. So the only person responded to us has been the Minister for Communities, but we'll persist. But I want to come back to this at the end, because he made a proposal. I'm assuming you're sec you've seconded that as well, so I think it's an action we need to take forward. Okay, so Agenda Item 6, Staten Orders, Temporary Provisions. Um. So, again, we're looking at um, the, as we call them, temporary provisions in light of the pandemic and a potentially agree a motion to extend these staten orders again. Um, just for reference, Emer has the paper um, at page 84 of our packs, which does provide some background and options available to us. And you, and you can see from that paper, and again, Emer fairly well laid out, but there are a number of options. So we can do nothing and let the provisions cease to have any effect. Agree today to extend, for example, to the end of 2021 or to the end of the mandate or consult with uh, CLG and the Business Committee on whether there is support for an extension. Um, now, the last option will require short consultation as the committee will be considering a draft motion um, in order to bring this before the assembly before the summer recess. So I just wanna I just wanna seek your views on this as well, please. Gary. Yeah, thanks, uh, Amy. Thanks, Chair. Uh, my suggestion, I think we should uh, consult with uh, the Business Committee and the, the CLG. I think that it would only be fair that, look, all parties are, are represented in the uh, the Business Committee as well, and I think that the chairs would have a fair um, reflection yeah. and an opinion. So I think just it, it doesn't have to be a lengthy exercise. It needs to be sorted, yeah. but maybe do a short consultation with those yeah. people, maybe. Fair enough, Gary. Anybody else have any other to agree with or to have a different opinion? Sinead wants to come in. Sinead, go for it. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I think consulting is um, probably wise. And unfortunately, you know, we can't say we're out of COVID just yet. So, you know, it, it would be wise for us to just hold a position and consult with others. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Is that, is that the view of the committee then? Yeah, we agree to do that. Okay. Um, so, well, well, Emer, what you make the necessary arrangements to provide a note to consult with the CLG and the business committee, please. Yes. Great okay. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you for that. So, proxy voting agenda item seven. So we we got. We're, well, it's really what we're asking for is to note the memo. So at Appendix 1, page 92, is response from the Speaker. And members may remember that the Speaker has raised this, uh, this a number of times regarding concerns that the, you know, 
gives serious consideration to an approach cautiously, which I just want to put in a record for Gareth and Rayson. We do it with everything, so you can tell a speaker of that. I'm only joking. But we also need to know um, if it is to include unforeseen circumstances. And we had some discussion about this a while back. So I just want to get your um, position on this, um, Emer. Sorry, it was just to also draw. We um, had some late additions in their tabled items responses as well that came in a, a new, a different yes. response from Sinn Féin and a further one from Alliance. Just okay. Two. Okay. So, the, the well, Emer, for clarity, take us through what the, the, ten, uh, the central tenants are from both responses, please. Um, so, in general, uh, it is approving of the parental leave um, policy position uh, for, for permanent proxy voting, as well as long term illness, and um, urging more, more than caution, really, that maybe guidance or if the committee are minded to continue on uh, with unforeseen circumstances as its policy position, um, and that's agreed that it would need to be defined. So there would need to be further work under, undertaken and that it would be defined what kind of circumstance would be included. Um, I can't find an example yet at this stage of such a circumstance uh, in use in other legislatures. I'm happy to go away and look. Well, could, could, we um, do, could, could we do that then if we could try and look to other legislators for what un, unforeseen circumstances were? But in the meantime... Um, you know what else? Responses also um, uh, invite a further look at um, consider the committee considering electronic voting as well uh, as part of this proxy voting review, or um, and there are a couple of the party responses that are not keen to extend proxy voting beyond the COVID circumstances. Okay, so is it fair to say then that we need to get additional information before we actually put this to a vote? Um, we need to get information on unforeseen circumstances. And Emer, if we could provide it in terms of, you know, each of the categories and what each of the parties responded to, and then we'll bring it back to a further committee meeting. Um, but conscious that we need to try and make a decision before summer recess. Is that far enough, everyone? Yeah, okay. Amy, are you happy enough with that? Yes, yes. Good stuff. Okay, so, um, and if we could just keep the speaker informed of what we're trying to do, just as a matter of courtesy, um, and, you know, uh, that we do, we are being cautious, and we are giving a serious consideration, but we haven't quite completed the information that we need to have in order to make a decision. Okay, so agenda item eight correspondence at page uh, 102 is the latest publication of the Human Rights Newsletter. So can can I agree that we just note this item? Okay, um, our forward work program. So we we have our forward work program there. So just to seek agreement on that, just to continue as is. Okay, there's no chairperson person's business. Um, does members have anything under AOB that they wish to raise? No? Okay. So before we go into closed session, um, the time and date of our next meeting is Wednesday the 2nd of June at 2.30 via Starleaf. So, Emer, I just want to thank everyone. I want to thank the officials on the call. I want to thank yourself for your work. Um, and if we could just now move into closed session and just wait for confirmation of that. Yes, Emer. Committee room 29.